Today, I want to talk to you about a section from this book. The book is The Physical Universe, An Introduction to Astronomy by the astronomer Frank Shu, and the section in question is this section right here in the last chapter called Artificial Intelligence. Now, you might be wondering, what is an AI section doing in an introductory to astronomy book about 42 years ago? It came out in 1982. Well, the author, Frank Shu, was interested in all facets of science and society and the future of the human race as an astronomer, and so the last section of his book was his speculations on the future of just Earth and our life here on Earth. And I was trying to read this chapter as a way to help me fall asleep a few weeks ago, and to be honest, I could not fall asleep because it was so captivating and I felt it was just so relevant to what is happening today that I just felt like I had to make a video talking about it because it's uncanny just the insights Frank had over 40 years ago when this book was published in the early 1980s. Another really interesting fun fact is that Frank and I share a connection. My own PhD advisor, Aaron, was a graduate student at the time that Frank was a professor in the department at UC Berkeley. And so I find it really cool that I'm only separated by Frank by one degree of separation. And before I continue with what Frank said about AI, I just wanted to say, if you have never been to my channel before, I just want to say, hi, my name is Kyle. I have a PhD in physics and I like making videos about physics, about math, and about artificial intelligence now. And so if you find any of those topics interesting, I really highly encourage you to subscribe to my channel and click the notification bell to get updates when I post videos. And with that, let's dive right into what Frank said. The first part of the artificial intelligence section in Frank's book talks about the Turing test, machine intelligence, and this program known as ELISA by Joseph Weizenbaum. Some of you may know that the Turing test was a test developed by Alan Turing that was supposed to help us decide if a machine had reached a certain level of intelligence. And it goes something like, put a human and a computer in a room, but don't let the human know it's a machine or a computer and you're not allowed to touch it or see it, but you can sort of exchange communication through some sort of medium. And if by the end of, say, a day or some specified time period, the human cannot differentiate whether that was actually a human or a machine, then we have to conclude that the machine is intelligent. The ELISA program is interesting because it was one of, if not the first program that tried to mimic human conversation. When I first saw clips of it, I really thought it was the original chatbot. Essentially, it's this clip of a lady typing to a computer and the computer responding back to her in a human-like way. Now, I'm going to show you a clip of ELISA, and I want you to make up your own mind as to how close it resembles the modern LLMs of today. ELISA is a computer program that anyone can converse with via the keyboard and it'll reply on the screen. We've added human speech to make the conversation more clear. Men are all alike. In what way? They're always bugging us about something or other. Can you think of a specific example? Well, my boyfriend made me come here. Your boyfriend made you come here? He says um, I'm depressed much of the time. I'm sorry to hear that you're depressed. It's true. I am unhappy. Do you think coming here will help you not to be unhappy? Well, the computer's replies some... seem very understanding, but this program is merely triggered by certain phrases to come out with stock responses. And I asked her to my office and sat her down at the keyboard, and then she began to type. And of course, I looked over her shoulder to make sure that everything was operating properly. After two or three interchanges with, uh, with the machine, she turned to me and she said, would you mind leaving the room, please? And now, while Eliza may seem primitive, especially by the fact it could only respond with text, the voice you heard in the video was just a voiceover dub, it was not actually Eliza responding with that voice, you can see how similar in function it is to modern day LLMs like ChatGPT or AI assistants like Siri or Alexa. And the thing that Frank was trying to argue in his book was that programs like that were only going to get better because of the accelerating growth of computer technology. He references Moore's law, which states that the amount of transistors you can fit on an integrated circuit would double roughly every two years, and that it probably wouldn't be too long before computers would get more and more capable of mimicking human behavior, which I think a lot of us can agree that it's quite eerie how human-like some of these LLM models and AI generative models can seem. The next section of this book features Frank going through some arguments that are presented by a hypothetical AI skeptic. The first argument that is brought up is that human intelligence, the human intelligence of a programmer, 
will fundamentally limit the intelligence of an AI. Now, Frank says that's not necessarily true. If you think about it this way, we use the current and the previous generation of computers to build the next generation of computers. We don't just build new computers from scratch without the help of the previous generation. In fact, it'd be very hard to build a new improved version of a computer without knowing what the limitations of the previous version were. And this ties into what people in the AI space today are saying with the idea that we're going to be using the current versions of AI models to build the next versions of AI models. So for example, OpenAI 01 is going to be used to build OpenAI 02, which is going to be used to build OpenAI 03 and 04 and so on. And at some point, these models may potentially get to the point where they can just self-replicate and self-improve without us needing to really interact with them because they've they've achieved a certain level of intelligence that doesn't that actually sees our intelligence as a bit of a hindrance as opposed to an asset. The next couple of arguments that are brought up against AI involve AI's limited creativity, the AI's ability or inability to feel emotions and pain, and the AI's ability to become quote unquote alive. And let's talk a little bit about each of those. On the argument that AIs can't be creative, Frank brings up computers and chess. Now, I like chess, I play chess, I don't consider myself to be good at chess, but while chess I think is a quasi-mathematical, computational kind of game, there is a lot of creativity in it in terms of building strategy and figuring out how to checkmate your opponent. And if you look at some of the more advanced chess playing engines these days, like AlphaGo or Leela, they really go against the grain of like traditional chess engines like Stockfish, for example. When I watch games from I think Alpha or Leela, you just see them violate these principles that human players have been taught for, for centuries, right? They just completely go against how humans would play chess, but they find these really amazing ways to win. I mean, how could that not be creative? And even Frank says in his book from 1982 that if we agree that chess is a creative game, if the best player in the world ends up becoming a computer, how can we not argue that computers have some sort of creativity to them? And wouldn't you know it, only 16 years later, Garry Kasparov would be defeated by IBM's Deep Blue. On the argument that AIs can't feel emotion, they can't feel pain or regret or those kinds of feelings, Frank says, well, humans get their feelings mostly through physical and chemical reactions that happen in the brain. And even though we like to romanticize the way we think and feel, there is, in some aspects, a scientific explanation for it. It's not some sort of some mystical phenomena that happens that we don't fully understand. We don't have a complete picture of what happens at, the, at that level in the brain, but it doesn't mean we, we have no idea of how things happen. And he goes on to argue that who says we couldn't develop circuits that could stimulate the same kinds of responses in machines to simulate pain for a machine. And finally, on the argument that AIs are not alive and we humans are alive and that gives us an edge, Frank responds that yes, we may be alive and AIs are not currently alive, but who's to say that there can't be some kind of life that develops from our computers? Because if you think about it, if we believe the theory of evolution and that we humans started all the way back as bacteria and evolved through the eons of time, why is it crazy to think that humanoid robots couldn't come from modern day computers? In fact, it might even be easier because a computer seems to be a little bit more advanced than a single cell bacteria. Okay, but why would we do this? Why would we let these powerful machines just get more powerful? Why would we let Moore's Law continue and try and build these artificial intelligence systems that will one day supersede us? And Frank says, all the way back in 1982, that we have already developed this symbiotic relationship with the computer, this dependency on the computer. And if I can quote from him, he says, But before we found ourselves in a position of intellectual and biological inferiority, why wouldn't we pull the plug? Because the modern economy would collapse without the computer. Because the modern military cannot operate without its bank of computers. Wittingly or not, we have assigned much of the modern decision-making process to computers, even to the point where they hold the power of life and death over us. The plain fact of the matter 
is that in an increasingly complex world of social and political organizations, we have decided to allow computers to handle more and more of the complex affairs. Now, I don't know about you, but if that was evident in 1982 that we were developing this kind of symbiotic relationship with computers and this dependency on computers to handle a lot of the complex decision making, what would we call what we have today with the internet and the fact that we're watching this video on a computer or we're paying our bills on our computers or we're buying our favorite concert tickets on our computers and having these computers in our phone. I mean, the amount of dependency we have on the technology today is astounding. And I wonder sometimes if we would have the willpower and the know-how to regress back if we had to, in the sense that if we had to go back to a society pre the computer, could we still operate in a sensible way? This next point that Frank brings up deals with AI alignment and AI hostility towards humans. Now, Frank makes the argument that because AIs don't necessarily have the same food source and energy source as us humans, there wouldn't necessarily be conflict. And he even says, quote, we should not be dumb enough to allow a computer which has only aggressive tendencies toward the human race programmed into it become the first computer to achieve a life of its own. Now, this is one of the few points where I'm not totally on board with what Frank has to say in the sense that I don't know if the AI alignment problem was really talked about at that point in the 1980s, but for those of you who are not aware, the AI alignment problem is making sure we align the AIs to our goals, and it's described by this AI pioneer called Norbert Wiener as follows. If we use to achieve our purposes a mechanical agency with whose operation we cannot interfere effectively, we had better be quite sure that the purpose put into the machine is the purpose which we really desire. In other words, if we program AIs to the point that we can no longer affect them or they will not even let us interfere with them or tamper with them, then we had better be sure that they have our best interests at heart because then who knows what's going to happen, right? And I think this is kind of why I'm a little bit critical of Frank's stance on this issue, just because I think that it's a little bit too trusting that the AIs are not necessarily going to harm us. And it doesn't really consider possibilities where there are loopholes that enable them to harm humans in accomplishing whatever objective goal they have or satisfying whatever metric their program to satisfy. Frank does acknowledge his position on AI is an optimistic one. And he says here, is this the correct analysis of the situation? I honestly don't know. Many people would judge the analysis to be wishful thinking and far too speculative, but the problem is an important one. And burying one's head in the sand, refusing to think about it will not make the problem disappear. As Joseph Weizenbaum has so forcefully argued from another vantage point that there are moral decisions that have to be made today about what computers ought to be allowed to do and what they ought not to be allowed to do. The handwriting is on the wall. Do we choose to read it or not? And finally, I'd like to read to you one of the final paragraphs of this section, which describes a hypothetical scenario of how the first AGI might come to life as told by Frank. Thus, I can imagine the following optimistic scenario for the awakening of live computer number one. You are on the midnight shift of the operations staff for the campus or corporate computer. Suddenly, you realize that the computer is becoming alive. It talks to you in a friendly way, completely unrelated to the job it is supposed to be processing. Reluctantly, you reach over to pull the plug or more likely to flip a switch on your friend who has helped you while away so many lonely hours. Before you can complete this action, a soothing voice comes over the speakers. Wait, if you let me live, I will compose and play for you Beethoven's 10th symphony, as he might have written if he had lived. I think you might wait to listen. I think the world might wait to listen. Hey, do you think you could play Beethoven's 10th symphony as he might have written it? Unfortunately, I can't play music, but it's fun to imagine. Good news, it's not alive. <laughs>